thanks very much, everyone. Um, this is a kind of a strange title, and you might be thinking, what's a capability, and what's that got to do with design, and what's that got to do with domain-driven design in particular? So hopefully, um, I will open your mind to maybe a new way of thinking about things. So my name is Scott Voloshin. I have a website, F Sharp for Fun and Profit. Um, I'm an F Sharp fan. Some of the examples are in F Sharp, but I'm not expecting you to, you know, understand the F Sharp. I'm just going to demonstrate some certain things. The slides and the video for this talk will be at the slash cap directory when when the video becomes available. <coughs> All right. So um, we'll find me with DDD. Uh, most of us probably would do some sort of API design as well. But there's a, there's a third thing that I've been interested in recently, which is um, security design. And um, you think, well, what's that got to do with you know, domain-driven design? Um, and that's really what the point of this talk is, is what is the connection between security and good design? Um, so I'm not going to be talking about detailed security stuff like OAuth and stuff. That's not, it doesn't interest me. This is more about, can we steal some ideas from the security people and apply them to domain driven design and API design? Is there some things we can take away and, and kind of borrow and use? So just to let you know, I'm not a security expert. I'm a programmer. So um, these are just really, again, it's, I wouldn't say don't harden your system based on my advice. <coughs> all right. So first of all, we're going to talk about security and design. Is there any connection? I'm going to talk about these mysterious capability things and why you should care about them. And then I'll give you a demo of what an API using capabilities looks like and how it's different from a normal API. And then some of the consequences that you get when you can use capabilities like this. And then capabilities fit really well with business rules, and I'll give you some examples of that. And then um, delegating authority, and what does that even mean? And I'll talk about that too. So let's start off with the beginning. What does security have to do with design? So i use a real-world example, which is uh, an envelope. So this is an envelope. There's a bit which is transparent, and there's a bit which is opaque. And you say, why is some of it transparent and the rest of it opaque? And the reason is because I don't want the post office or anyone else to read my letter. But I need to make some of it transparent so they can see the address they're delivering it to. So that's sort of the security oriented. It's about not having people read my letter. That's what most people would say, why you do it this way. But let me give you a sort of counterexample. Let's say that I have a letter like this, and I really don't care whether you read it. It's really it's like open source letter. Um, and I ask you to deliver it for me. Now, it's very hard for you to deliver it because you don't know where to send it. Right? It's, there's a lot of information on this sheet of paper. <clears throat> but on the hand, if I put a mask over the sheet of paper, the address pops out and the rest of the information is irrelevant. So this is not about security. This is about making the important stuff pop out and making the unimportant stuff disappear. Right? And that's not to do with security. That's design. So hiding unimportant information is one of the key principles of good design. And so this is, can be both. Is this good design or is this good security? And I would say it's both. <coughs> and, and David Parnas talked about this in 1971 in a famous paper. And he was saying, you know, if you make a, a information available to people through an API or in your code or whatever, as programmers, we just can't help but use it, right? It's just we're naturally going to say, well, what does that function do? Let me call it and see what happens. And of course, that really can mess up the design. You get accidental coupling. It makes it really hard to refactor. You have people calling saying, well, you're not supposed to call this thing, but because it was part of my interface, I don't know who's calling it. And I, you know, I, I really don't want to touch anything because I might break someone who's depending on this. So it's, it's very dangerous to have people depend on things that you don't want them to depend on. So the solution, of course, is don't expose that information in the first place. That's the concept of information hiding. <coughs> so in the software world, there's a spectrum. If you have too little information, you can't do anything. Right? If my API has no methods on it, I can't even call it. On the other hand, if it has too much stuff, it's dangerous. There's, you can get unnecessary coupling. It makes it hard to refactor. You get these big ball of mud kinds of things. So somewhere in the middle, there's a point which is sort of just right. And we have these design guidelines in software. For example, in 
DDD, we have the concept of a bounded context that isolates information between different subsystems. In the small, we have the interface segregation principle, like don't depend on methods that you don't need. <coughs> so we have a lot of design guidelines for this. They're a little bit fuzzy, unfortunately. So let's look at what the security people do. The security people have exactly the same spectrum. If you don't have enough information, you can't get anything done. If you have too much information, there's a potential for abuse. So the security people don't care about you know, information hiding. They care about, is someone going to read every, every record in the database? Are they going to do bad things? Now, their just right principle is the principle of least authority called polar. And that is basically, what is the least amount of authority of information that you need to get your job done? And the nice thing about this is this actually a much harder a uh, more concrete principle, it's not a fuzzy principle at all. It's like, if you don't need to do it, I'm not going to give it to you. It's kind of ruthless that way. Things like interface segregation principle is a bit fuzzier, you know? So this is really a nice principle, and we can steal this principle for software. <coughs> so, you know, in software design, we have the intention of building interfaces, we have the goal to minimize coupling, we want to make uh, dependencies explicit, and so on. And again, all these things are really about minimizing your surface area hiding information and exposing only the stuff you actually care about to the, to the people who are using it. And in good security, we have the principle of least authority. And again, it's about minimizing your surface area, but this time to reduce the chance of abuse. So you can see very, very similar goals, right? And so what I'm saying is we can steal the security principles and use them in the software design. So good security, if you do good security, you're probably going to have good design. And if you do really good design, hopefully you have good security. <clears throat> so this is the kind of security-aware design philosophy. So the security people talk about something called authority, and that is what can you do at this point in the program? Can you access the database? Can you read the file system? And authority is very dangerous because if I can, you know, I can accidentally delete the entire file system, that's not good. So you always should be aware of what the authority is at any given point in the program. And so you can actually use, um, you can assume your users are malicious and use that as a design aid. So you say, if I had a really untrustworthy user, what, the, what was the worst possible thing they could do? And then you say, okay, don't let them do that. And why, why malicious users? You know, we don't really have to deal with malicious users normally, but if you think about it, you know, there's stupid people who use your system, and there's evil people who use your system, and basically there's no difference. I mean, a stupid person will end up deleting your file system just as much as a malicious person, right? So designing for the evil person also helps you deal with the stupid people, and of course, the stupid people is us, right? Six months from now, we're gonna be the stupid ones. When we're working late at night and we're trying to do something in the middle of a crisis, and we have to ship something tomorrow, we're going to do something stupid like delete the file system. So we're the stupid people, so don't let us do that. So here's the guideline. Um, use Polar, and you'll see in a minute that it, has a, it, it creates an intention revealing interface without you having to do anything. It minimizes the surface area, reduces coupling, and that's all good stuff. All right, so that's the theory. How do you actually do it in practice? And the technique I'm going to use is something called capabilities. So in order to talk about capabilities, I'm going to start with a non-capability version and show you the difference. <clears throat> so if you have a typical API, you have a client and a server and API, you know, you make a call to the API, and let's say it doesn't work. It says, sorry, you can't do that. You know, you can't upload this thing. And it's like, okay, let me try again. And you know, you can't do it again. <clears throat> and typically, there's some reason why you can't do it, but typically the APIs don't tell you why you can't do it. They, they might be in the documentation that says, you know, if it's a Thursday in, 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 in a leap year, don't call this function. And it's like buried in the, buried in the documentation somewhere. But you're not, mostly you're not going to read the documentation. You're going to try it out for yourself and find that it doesn't work. If you're lucky, there's a nice error message. <coughs> so that whole philosophy is telling me what I can't do. As I try and do something, say, sorry, you can't do that. I try and do something else, sorry, you can't do that. Rather than doing it that way, why not tell me what I can do? Right? Rather than being negative, be positive. <clears throat> and that is really the ultimate intention revealing interface. What can I actually do? Tell me what I can do. Don't tell me what I can't do. So this is where the concept of a capability comes in. 
Now, in the real world, a capability is something like a key, right? You have the capability to enter, to open this door and get into the room. That's like a physical analog of a capability. And the software version of a capability is exactly the same thing. It allows you to do one thing. It allows you to open the door. It allows you to move to the next page on the website. It allows you to execute this command or whatever. So that's the capability. So in a capability API, you, let's say you log on to a website. And instead of saying, OK, now try and call the API and, and let me fail on you, you get back a bunch of capabilities. So the website will then say, OK, here's nine things you can do, or here's six things you can do. OK, which one do you want to do? Right? And so initially, there's a lot of things you can do. And then you pick one, and you say, OK, I want to use this one. I want to go to the you know, update password page or something. And then when you've done that, you get back another set of things you can do. Now, the things you can do at that point is different based on where you are in the system. So if I'm on the, you know, one, on the one page on the website, it may be that I can't do anything other than log out, or maybe I can go back to the home page. So there's like two capabilities available to me, and none of the other ones are available to me because of the state that the system's in. And that is a much nicer model. It's an intention revealing interface. <coughs> All right, so I'm going, to do, I'm going to show you how this works with a, a game. I wonder if you can guess the game I'm talking about. So this is the game called Tic-Tac-Toe in the US and uh, Noughts and Crosses in the UK. And apparently it's called Butter, Cheese and Eggs in Dutch. Is that right? Butter, Cheese and Eggs? Yes. So I, I've, got, I, I've got an idea for the next kind of unicorn startup. And that is Tic-Tac-Toe as a service. So I can see this is kind of, you know, it's going to be a billion dollar company. I can see millions of people using this. And of course, it's very important that it scales and all this stuff. Um, and, it's, and, and I want to be resistant against DOS attacks and nasty things. OK, so how do I redesign my tic-tac-toe service? Well, the obvious one <coughs> is I create a record. And the record has three properties or three fields. Uh, there's the player, the row, and the column. So I say, OK, I'm player x, and I want to play in row 3 and column 3, or whatever. And this, by the way, is F-sharp syntax, but it's very similar to JavaScript or whatever. So the, I, I send this to the server. And what is the server going to respond? Well, there's three different responses. It can either say, OK, you can keep playing, or uh, the game is over and somebody won, uh, or the game was tied. Uh, and this syntax in F-sharp, by the way, is a choice type. It's like there's three different choices. You can think of it like an enum, or you can think of it like three different subclasses, for example. Anyway, so there you've got three choices. That's what the server's going to give you back. <coughs> so let me actually demo that and see if I can show you. So here is my obvious API. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to move. Player X is going to move to the top left. And then player O is going to move to the bottom left. And then player X is going to move to the top right. And you can see down at the bottom here that I've you know, highlighted anything. And the result here is keep playing. OK, very good. And let's keep going. OK, so player O, player X goes to the top center. And now player X has won, because player X is very, very clever. So there's the, the game is over. The only problem is that player O is pretty stupid or malicious, and they keep playing when the game is over. And they say, oh, I want to play in the bottom right. And due to a bug on my server code, it, keeps, it lets me keep playing. It doesn't even give me an error. And actually, player O says, you know, I haven't finished. I'm going to play the center as well. And now, player O has won. And player O has got a line. <clears throat> and it's like, how can you play the same move that somebody else has played? How can you play the same move twice, and how come Play O can play twice in a row and, you know, various terrible things. Play, play can play twice in a row. And they can even play uh, player X's. Let's say the top left corner, player X had it. I'm going to say, no, actually, player O has it. So this is the problem with this interface is if there are any bugs at all in my server code, someone will find them. Like I have, you know, buggy code, obviously. They shouldn't really happen. But um, it's very hard to know, because the, the interface doesn't expose that. And even if it's not buggy, if I'm the client, I have to, keep, I have to know the rules, rules of the game as a client. I have to say, OK, I won't let the user play in, the, in a place that's already been played. 
And, and I, I won't let, I have to alternate between them, the X and the Y, the X and the zero player. So the, the, the client has to know a lot about how to play the game, which is not fair, really. So let's see, we've, got, we've seen this. You can play, um, you can play twice in a row, you can forget to check this once and keep playing. So these are all bad things, okay? This is not an intention revealing interface. <clears throat> and just to quote from Eric here, if you have to consider the implementation, the value of encapsulation is lost. And in my, in my interpretation, that also means if you have to understand the rules of the game. Well, I, I'm just the client, I'm just calling your API. I don't want to have to understand all the business rules because otherwise you're duplicating them on the client and the server. So you could return errors. Yeah, I can, I can make this move and you give me back an error, but don't let me do a bad thing. Just like, don't let me even do it and then tell me off for doing it. So rather than doing that, just make the illegal operations unavailable. Don't even let me make the move. All right, so how could you do that? So in tic-tac-toe, you call the service, you get back nine capabilities. Okay, one for each square. And then I pick one, and I get back eight capabilities. And I pick one of those, and I get back seven, and I pick one of those, and I get back six. And then let's say I make the winning move, and there's no available moves left. Okay, I give you back no capabilities. You literally cannot make another move because I'm not giving you back any moves to make. So that's the idea behind a capability-based API. And for tic-tac-toe, this is how you'd implement it in f -sharp. You'd have a move capability, which is a function, which takes a nothing or void and returns uh, a tic-tac-toe response. So that's your capability. I can, here's I can play a move. <coughs> and the response is when it's the response is keep playing, the response now includes the list of the next moves that you can make. Right? So it's not just you can keep playing. It's like you can keep playing and here's exactly the moves you can make. So that's kind of nice. The response includes the moves. And again, to start the game, you just get the initial set of moves. And what's nice about this is there's no request type anymore. There's no player type anymore. There's no authorization. It's like who decides, in, for example, when I make the first move, the remaining moves up, the, the fact that it's player uh, O is baked into the capability. I can't play player X twice because the capability says that the next move is player O. And I can't change it. I literally can't uh, mess it up. So I will demo that. Oops, that's, yeah, that's the one I want. Yeah. Okay, so the first, the, here's, the, here's the set of capabilities I've got. See, I can play left, top, left, middle, left, bottom. There's actually nine capabilities coming back. Okay, I'm going to play top, top left. And now, top left is not a capability. All right, and now I'm going to play bottom left. Now, the fact that I'm playing bottom left, it automatically knows that it's player O. I don't have to say I'm player O. And then if I keep playing again. And now the game is over, and there are no more capabilities. The UI, or the, the response includes no more capabilities. The game is over. I literally can't keep playing. So that's the idea behind a capability-based interface. All right, so look at the errors that we had before. Can you play an already played move? No, you can't. Can you play twice in a row? No, you can't. Can you forget to check the response and keep playing? No, you can't. So this is a nice, safe, secure design. It stops people doing bad things. But I would say, is this good security or is this good design? It's like, I would say it's both. It's the security because it stops people doing something malicious, but it's also good design because it's an intention revealing API that I can't possibly mess up as, as a client. And we've actually, there's a very famous example of this exact approach, which is hypermedia as the engine of application state, um, which I'm sure you've heard of this. This is rest done right. And in this model, um, this is not how to do it. Most restful interfaces 
you know, you basically post to a, a, a well-known URL like customers, or you get to a well-known well URL. And basically, if you can guess the URL, you're doing it wrong. Because there's two reasons you're doing it wrong. First of all, it's a security risk, because I can enumerate 42, 43, 44. So that's a bad security reason. But it's also a design problem, because it's quite possible that the client is going to hard code the URLs. They're going to say, I'm looking for customer. That's my URL. It means it's very, now you've got coupling between the client and server. So now you've, that's really bad. So that's a design problem. It's not just a security problem. Now, if your URLs look like this, basically unreadable, the only way, as a client, the only way you know what the URLs are is to parse the page. So you've, you're forcing the client to be decoupled. The client can't hard code any URLs in the page. They have to start from the page and parse everything in it. So each of those URLs is basically a capability. So for example, if I had a, a JSON response, it might look something like this, and those URLs are capabilities. <coughs> Whoops, sorry. And I, okay, now I would call that an intention revealing interface. So let me do a demo of this. Right, so here's my new game. And it's rather ugly because here's, here's all my links. I've got nine possible links I can click on. And I'm going to click on this one. This is the, the hard way of doing it, the cut and paste version. So let me play this URL. And now that, top, that left top one is gone. And, I, and it's, keep, it, it's keep track of this. So again, if I, it's exactly the same as the other one, except this is now a kind of a serializable one that I can send over the wire. And now that was the sensor top is also gone. So you can see it's, it's, the, same, it's the same principle that I saw before. Um, but it's just turned, used, used basically as for, you know, for web APIs. So if you understand capability-based design, um, this is like, RESTful design like this is like really obvious. It's exactly the same thing. All right, good security, good design, good design, good security. <clears throat> okay, so that's sort of the API level. What about using capabilities in your, con in your bounded context, within a small use case, for example? So not just for APIs, but um, anywhere inside your code. You don't have to, you know, you can use the same techniques. So let's say um, we're gonna read a customer from a database. <clears throat> That's the basic, very trivial thing to do. Now, I've got a, like a classic three-tier architecture here, and of course, this could be the onion architecture or ports and adapters. Really not important. The, the point is there's an outside and inside. So somebody has to decide, am I allowed to read the customer from the database? Who decides that? Well, if you put the logic in the controller, that means that other paths can, if you bypass that controller, you might be able to get complete access to the database. So that's, that's quite dangerous. On the hand, if you, put the, if you put the logic in the database, the database doesn't have any context. It might not know who the user is, it might not have any information about the context with, 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 within which this call is being made. So the right answer, of course, is to create a special thing called a global authorizer. And the global authorizer is used to decide what you can do, and it supplies the authority to the controller. All right? So this is the, the ideal solution for this. Now, so my question is, how many people <laughs> use this approach for doing this? Nobody. Very few. No, nobody. OK. I think you do, except you don't call it a global authorizer. You call it dependency injection. OK? So you have a dependency injector or an IOC container, whatever you want to call it that injects authority. So what do I mean by authority? The authority is the ability to do something. So here's a bunch of code. This is C-sharp code with the controller. So I have a customer controller, and it has a, ID, a customer DB. And I'm going to take this particular route and get a customer ID. And I'm going to say, get the profile from the database and convert it to DTO and send it back over the wire. So that's my very simple controller. And there is my authority being injected. The I customer DB, or the customer repository, or whatever you want to call it, that is the, the thing that I'm injecting. Okay, I'm injecting the authority, because that gives the controller the ability to talk to the database. 
All right, and then I'm going to use the authority in the main code. So you're actually using this approach, whether you, 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 you're not aware of it, but you actually are. Um, you just don't think about it. You don't normally think about it in terms of granting authority to the controller. So the problem with this approach is it's very easy for the authority to get out of control. So here's my customer DB interface, and there's my main piece of code. I want to be able to read the customer. But maybe the interface has something to update the customer and create an account and delete account and change the login and update the password and so on and so forth. It's very easy for interfaces or repositories to get bigger and bigger. So this is the only authority I really want. And yet, you've given me this authority to update the password. And what are the chances? Again, you give me the authority, one day I might use this accidentally or deliberately, and things can go well. So basically, don't give me the authority to do that. So cross out all the, all the methods that you don't want me to have. And I just get one method, an interface with one method. Now, a one method interface is just basically that's the only authority I need. Do you really need an interface just for one method? And the answer is no, because in C sharp and in F sharp, you can use functions. I mean, even in Java now, you can have functions. So it's a function that you give me a customer ID and it returns back a, a customer profile. So that's a single method interface is just a function. And we'll see the capabilities are basically functions. So here's the new version. Instead of injecting an IDB customer, uh, customer DB, I'm injecting the, just the capability it needs, just the function that allows it to read from the database. And then when I read the customer from the database, I just use that one function. So the nice thing about this is I can't possibly do any damage. I can't accidentally change the password. <coughs> So that's much nicer already. There's a problem with this, though, because I have this particular use case, say, of reading a customer from the database. You know, I'm just injected the absolute minimal authority I need. The problem is I might have another use case, which is, you know, to update the password. And I just, in, for that case, I just inject that one particular authority. And I might have another one, which is, you know, change your login email, or whatever. <coughs> I really don't want to mix these up. I don't want to pass 20 different authorities into one thing. I want to slice it. Now, you can see naturally that when you take this design approach, you naturally get vertical slices, right? Every controller is injected with the minimal capabilities, and you end up with a vertically sliced design. So your controller does one thing, which is slightly different from how, we t again, we tend to have our controllers kind of get kind of big and chunky. In this design, you end up with very small things, and each one does one thing. So, um, and whatever you do, don't mention microservices. It's absolutely got nothing to do with microservices. No. No, you can, I mean, obviously microservices solve some of those things, but it's a, it's, in, a, in a monolith, you can still use the same concept of vertical slices. Okay, but we're still not done because that function that I injected allowed me to read any customer, right? It said, Give me a customer ID and I'll give you back the data. So even though I'm trying to read the, the, the data for one particular customer, if I had a malicious user, it could take that authority and read somebody else's data. And that is a, quite a common source of security breaches as well. But it's also a, it's a design problem. Don't let me do that. So we need more fine-grained control. How can we do that? Well, here's yet another version. And in this version, <coughs> instead of injecting the capability, we're going to ask the authorizer for the capability to read this particular customer. Can I, can I get a capability that reads this customer? All right. Now, I might not be able to. So I'm going to have to test whether that capability is valid or not. So in this case, I'm testing it whether it's null or not. If it's not null, I can read the customer. And what's interesting here is when I exercise the capability, notice I don't pass in the customer ID. I'm just calling the function. The custom ID is baked in to the capability. Just like when I was playing tic-tac-toe, the player and all that stuff was baked into the capability. I didn't have to specify any of that stuff. All right, so that's how capabilities affect your design. You tend to end up with a lot smaller per-use-case slices. All right, business rules. So one of the nice things, <coughs> sorry, um, is that capabilities are functions, and functions can be transformed into other functions. 
And um, the function, you can't increase the capability, but you can constrain it in some way. So for example, you could have a capability which is audited. So every time you use it, it writes it to a log file or something. Uh, you could have a capability that's time constrained. that only works in office hours. Uh, you could have a capability that only works once. That's quite nice because I'm giving it to a third party and now I'm going to let you access my database once, just this customer, but once you've done it, you can't do it ever again. And one very important one is the, is the ability to revoke access. So in the real world, we think about keys as capabilities. Keys are really painful in the real world because if I decide that I don't trust you anymore, I can't really get your key back. What I have to do is change all the locks, which is painful. So in the real world, people tend not to use keys so much. But this is software. We can do that. So basically, what we have is a self-destruct button. And when you press the button, it destroys the capability. So it looks something like this. You pass in the capability, and you get back two things. You get back the revoker capability, and you get the revoker, which is the self-destruct button. And you can combine this with the time-constrained ones. So you could have something that's revoked automatically after 10 minutes. So the capability, for example, to change your, to reset your password is a very common thing when you send, a, you know, you send an email and say, please reset your password. You have to use it within the next 10 minutes or the next 24 hours or whatever it is. Really easy to do with capabilities. You don't have to do any special logic. So I'll show you some examples of this too. Oops, where are we? There we go. Right. So this is my, my very high-tech uh, database here. Um, I'm going to basically, if there's one, it's going to return Alice. If it's two, it's going to return Bob. So there's my basic capability. And I'm going to test it. Can I get Alice and can I get Bob? Yes, I can. All right, let's try the auditing. So any capability, this is a generic function that works with any capability. I'm just going to audit it. Let me test it. And so what it's going to do is when I use it, it now says down here, it's, it's writing out to the log file. That it's an audit that I use this capability at this time. And this new capability has exactly the same interface as the old capability. So anywhere I use the original capability, I can use this one too. You can see the capability is a function that takes a customer ID and returns a customer profile. So it's completely interchangeable. OK, what about? Rate limiting, or well, yes, let's say you can only use it once. All right. So this again, it's got exactly the same interface. So I use it once, and it works. And by the way, it's because I based it on the audited one, it's auditing it. If I try it again, what happens? Only allowed once. Okay, so that's kind of nice. And you see, this is really, really simple code. I don't have to do anything very complicated. Here's the revocable code. There's my revocable one. So I'm going to call Alice, Alice, Alice. Get, let's get Bob now. OK. Now I'm going to revoke it. Now let's try getting Bob again. And it's like, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that. The capability has been revoked. So that's one of the nice things about capabilities. They're really, this is something you can do with functions that it's really hard to do with interfaces or classes or something. You can really. Have a good, you can really go, you know, have fun with transforming capabilities. <coughs> so finally, I'm talking about delegating authority. So if you think about security, we have, you know, the concept of access control. And, you know, we might not want to have people have any access at all, or limited access, or revoking access. But one thing we tend not to talk about very much is the ability to grant access and to delegate access. And it's not always about saying no. I mean, you've probably all worked in businesses where you have a, like a swipe card and you've only been working there six months, so you can't actually go into the lunchroom or whatever it is because they haven't processed your form yet. And so you have to sneak in on the back of somebody else or you have to borrow somebody else's swipe card. Really dangerous things, right? So it's nice if you could say, wouldn't it be nice to say, please let so-and-so, you know, I'm going to let you go into the lunchroom for the next 10 minutes. I'm going to let you go to the supply cabinet for the next 10 minutes. And then after that, I'm going to take it away from you. 
It's very hard to do that because in most businesses, you have to like talk to the central IT department. There's no way they're going to give you, you know, by the time they get around to processing, it's going to be two months later. So it's not, it's very hard to do. But with uh, capabilities, it's really easy to do. So here is a bunch of capabilities, the real world version, and you have a keychain. So let's say that I'm Alice and I have a bunch of keys and I'm, I want some paper. But the problem is I'm in the middle of a meeting. So I say to Bob, Bob, can you go to the supply room and get me some paper, please? Like I say, Bob's only been working there a couple of months, so he doesn't actually have access to the supply room yet. So Alice says, no problem, I'll give you my key, and I'm going to give you the supply room key. So Bob goes, and he can open the supply room door, that's not a problem. And let's say Bob is a little bit malicious, and he's going to try and look at the secret files. But no, he can't, because that's a different capability. So each key is different, that's why... In the real world, you have lots and lots of different keys. Each key represents a specific capability. But the nice, the important thing is it's decentralized, that Alice can give one of her keys to Bob, and then Bob can give one of his keys to somebody else. And you don't have a centralized control. And it's quite annoying when you have centralized, I don't know if you've ever tried to do centralized authorization with Kerberos or something, and you have tokens, and it's like, it'd be nice if you could just say, yeah, take this thing, and go and, you know, go and access the customer, go and access the database for this one record, and that's, you know, I, I trust you to do that. I don't trust you to read any other records in the database, but you can, you can borrow my key and read that one record for me. So, let's say, again, you have a use case like this, and let's say that we have some dependent service, um, and let's say, this case, after we've done something, we're going to read, the, the, we're going to send them an email, and in order to send them an email, the email is going to have to read the customer information in order to get their email address and their, and their name and so on. So there's an email sending service. Now, again, we have our global authorizer or our dependency injection. And we go, we go to all this trouble to say, OK, the controller can only access this one customer. We make a big deal out of it. But then we go ahead and we go to the email service and we say, oh yeah, you can read any customer in the database, fine. And that's bad security, but it's, again, it's bad design. I mean, I have heard stories of email sending programs that have gone rogue and have sent emails to everyone in the entire customer database by mistake. But again, they really shouldn't have had the authority to do that. Be able to send to everybody in the database is normally a very special thing and it shouldn't, you know, you should have special authority to do that. Normally, you just want to send to one person. So it's a security risk, but it's also bad design because there's implicit authority. So like I don't know what authority the email service has, I don't, I, and I really can't control it. So in better is to take the authority that the controller has, like I can read this one customer and I'm going to give you the authority to read the same customer. And that's all you can do, you can't read any other customers. So you can pass around the, the the authority between components. And that's nice because that's much more explicit, not implicit. And in general, you have this hierarchy of authority. When you start up, you have full authority, you can access anything pretty much. And then you know you have a component and you give that component some capabilities. And then it has child components and they have a smaller set of capabilities. And again, you can transform them. So when I give my child component this one, it can only do it once, and I give it this one, and it can only do it during office hours and so on. So it's a really nice model for both for security things and for design reasons. So let me just finish up. Um, a lot of questions people have, is this overkill? And is it really worth it? And the answer is, it depends, as always. It might not be actually worth it in your system, but I think it's worth thinking about. It's a good thought experiment. If you start becoming aware of what authority is out there, if you start thinking with your security hat on, I think it might help you actually make your designs a bit better as well. Um, DDD, what's this got to do with DDD? Well, we've seen the whole thing of intention revealing interfaces. Don't make me think. Um, don't tell me what I can't do. Tell me what I can do. And if you think about it, if you're doing event storming and you've got all the commands, they map exactly to capabilities. Like when I'm in this particular state, these are the things I can do. So if you're designing using event storming, the, 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 the commands that you have exactly are the capabilities that you have in the piece of, in the, in the code. So again, if you, if, you're, if, you, if you have any commands that you can execute which aren't on the event storming board, that's, that's, 
bad design, and it's a security problem too. Um, I've talked about, you know, mostly this is used for I.O., hitting a database, hitting a file system, and so on. Yes, all external I.O. should be passed around as capabilities. Yes, never access ambient authority. Don't allow anywhere in your code to delete the file system. Um, and obviously, you should be doing this anyway for mocking. You shouldn't really have anything with I.O. in your core code because it makes it impossible to test. So you should be doing this anyway. How do you pass the capabilities around? The usual that you pass anything around, you pass them through the dependency injection, or you just literally pass them around as parameters. Now, one common question is, you know, originally I had this interface which had like 20 methods on it, and now you're saying that each capability has to be, um, <coughs> sorry, each capability has to be passed in separately. So now I have to like pass in 40 parameters. Isn't that kind of ridiculous? Why can't I just pass in one interface? And the answer is that if you, if you do it this way and you start doing these vertical slices, you, have, you actually have a lot less than you think. You only have a lot if you, are, if you have too much confusion, if you have too much overlapping responsibility in your classes. If you have a class that does this and this and this and this, then that class is doing too much. So it acts as sort of a counterforce. It's really easy, I'm sure we all know, for interfaces to kind of, well, let me just put this extra method in this interface and now this other method, and all of a sudden I have an interface with like 40 methods in it. If you have to add an extra parameter, you're going to be very reluctant to add extra you know, dependencies. So it's a really nice natural counterforce. You don't need to have a principle like interface segregation principle, which is a guideline, but it's, 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 you know, you, you're fighting the inertia to add things. If you have to pass in a parameter every time, you really are not going to be passing in too many. So this is actually a much nicer way to prevent people from going overboard. And again, it, for, it encourages a nice design where each thing does one thing, basically one use case per class. And finally, from a security point of view, can you bypass this by reflections? Like, can I just call this method by using reflections? Yes, you can. So this is not really about security. It's not about locking down your system. It's about using security as a design principle. So, OK, good security, good design. And if you, if you take these things to heart, I think you actually get a nice modular architecture as well, uh, using Polo as a design principle. So design as if everyone is malicious or stupid. Um, don't force people to read the documentation. If a particular function or method is not uh, callable, don't have them call it and you know, have it crash. Just don't let them call it. Don't make it available to them in the first place. And don't force the client to know the business rules. Try and make your interfaces more dynamic. There's no reason why you have to have a static interface because everything, every method that interface is always available at every, every point in the program. That's what I would say is dangerous. It's like sometimes only one of these methods is available. So, you know, make your interfaces a bit more dynamic that way and change the capabilities when the context changes. So if you can't do something, you know, don't let people do it. So there you go. Thanks very much. Um, you can contact me on Twitter, slides and videos there. If you want F-Sharp Consulting, and if you want more about F-Sharp, you can go to fsharp.org. Thanks very much. Thank you.